All right, welcome everybody. My name is Rusty Mahalik. I'm the ACRL Leadership Discussion Group convener. Um, I'm very happy to have our first presentation for our upcoming book, Toxic Cultures in Academic Libraries, which will be published by ACRL Press, which we it should be coming out sometime in spring. Um, today, we are going to be hearing from Amanda Guzara and Stephanie Becker about maintenance as a core value, recommendations for increasing gender equity on digital scholarship teams. And now we're going to hand it over to them. Okay, I'm just going to set up my uh, screen share. How's that looking? Looks good to me. Great. All right. Cool. Um, so hi, everybody. My name is Amanda Kajura, and I am the head of scholarly communication and data services at the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. And I'm Stephanie Becker. I am the digital asset management systems administrator at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And thanks, thanks for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk about maintenance as a core value. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to speak about the importance of really valuing maintenance-based labor within digital scholarship work specifically, and how valuing maintenance-based labor can increase equity, equity within our workplaces. So Amanda and I really began exploring this topic because as two women who work in this field, we noticed how maintenance work had been just continually undervalued in the field. And once we really dove into the literature, those observations of ours were validated amongst other scholars. And it became a topic that we wanted to explore specifically in relationship to digital scholarship. And throughout this work, it became clear to us that patriarchal gender norms influence the way that digital scholarship teams operate, which contributes to a toxic workplace culture where women are at a disadvantage. I'll also just say that using a gender binary lens is in no way a reflection of the nuances of gender identity, but we do find it helpful when discussing power and patriarchal impact because binary gender roles help to uphold that patriarchal power. So while we were evaluating roles and responsibilities of typical digital scholarship teams, we realized that a lot of the work fell within two main overarching categories, one being innovation and the other being maintenance. So to borrow a common metaphor, innovation is the visible tip of the iceberg that's supported by the much larger maintenance piece hidden beneath the water. And we can kind of see in the slide here um, that the innovation peak is peaking out from above the water. So in digital scholarship, innovative work includes new project consultations, implementing cutting edge hardware and software, and spending time on research and development. So just like the tip of this iceberg, innovative work is highly visible and it encompasses advanced idea generation, experimenting with new technologies, guiding methodological decision-making, and often presenting the eventual project output. These are all critical pieces of the research life cycle, but they really only represent a portion of the overall labor required to successfully produce digital scholarship. And a lot of the times the innovative pieces are also the most marketable parts of our work and can easily be presented to an audience. So going back to this metaphor then, maintenance work is the portion of the iceberg below the ocean surface and it supports the visible tip of innovation. Maintenance is the mostly invisible work that happens behind the scenes to develop and sustain the infrastructure needed for successful digital scholarship projects. And this can include things like day-to-day -day operations, developing and implementing workflows, training, data management and cleaning, digital archiving, copyright research, 
and generally just developing and troubleshooting the behind the scenes technology systems and processes that keep our projects going. It's a lot of the less flashy work that is needed to preserve legacy projects, systems, and data. Additionally, we also consider educational and outreach efforts that introduce people to digital scholarships, such as course embedded instruction, workshop series, and open access advocacy, all as maintenance work. These are slightly more visible than the administrative and infrastructure work we already mentioned, but outreach initiatives are often unrecognized given the difficulty of tracking the immediate impact outreach sessions can have. So while both categories of work are vital to the success of any digital scholarship team, we've observed that the divide between innovation and maintenance tends to mimic binary gender norms with men carrying out valued and visible innovative labor while women perform invisible and undervalued maintenance work. So to address this divide, we can turn to a feminist ethic of care, which seeks to illuminate the relationships of small components within great systems. Care, care ethics really speaks to the importance of understanding and respecting how all work by all contributors in digital scholarship contributes to the success of the whole. Our culture tends to recognize and support only the most visible pieces and are therefore harming the morale and careers of maintainers without whose work digital scholarship teams couldn't be successful. On digital scholarship teams, the gendered labor of innovation and maintenance reinforces itself within internal team dynamics and operations through individually assigned roles and responsibilities. These include things like who's assigned primary responsibility for administrative tasks, project documentation, day-to-day -day operations, and developing cross-departmental workflows. But by critically examining these team dynamics and centering maintenance as a core value, we can start to move away from patriarchal modes of working and instead establish a feminist approach to digital scholarship work, which aims to increase gender equity amongst team members. So there are a couple of patterns we are going to highlight today that contribute to maintenance work being more invisible and undervalued, like much work throughout pink collar professions. So first, let's uh, talk about institutional priorities. So the foundational maintenance activities that keep a university, a library, or a digital scholarship team or project running are often not reflected in the documented priorities of our institutions. These documents often use language that focuses on innovation, technology, and whatever the latest trends are. Cutting edge this, transformational that. Um, while ignoring core operations, often explicitly excluding them. The exclusion of maintenance from strategic plans and mission statements deliberately implies that maintenance, according to administrators, is lesser in value than that of innovation. This creates an environment where the work of innovators, who often are men, um, is highly valued while the labor of maintainers, who are often women, who tend to operations, infrastructure, and other often invisible needs like office housework, is quietly relegated to the background. So since maintenance work is not a stated priority, it can sometimes be challenging to get the resources needed to keep core activities running. Maintenance work can be resource intensive and requires ongoing funds that have cost increases over time. Things like costs for vendor contracts, digital storage solutions, handle servers, software updates and fixes, and of course, the internal labor to make all of that actually happen. So the resources, care, and labor that goes into managing all of these things is largely invisible, not only to library patient, patrons, but to library and university administrators as well. So despite being a mission-critical resource, infrastructure isn't on display in an exhibition, nor is it featured in campus-wide marketing efforts that tend to boost all things innovation. Without visibility and strategic priorities to point to, maintainers can spend large amounts of their time and energy, sometimes spanning years, advocating for the program programmatic resources they need to fulfill core functions of their jobs. Oftentimes, the only time maintenance truly becomes visible is when something breaks, and even then, the focus is often more on fixing it as quickly as possible, rather than looking for long-term solutions that could prevent issues. 
The need to center maintenance is often ignored because of the invisibility of this labor and the and its invisibility in our priorities, which can have significant impacts on the working conditions and careers of those in maintenance positions. Um, another um, issue uh, that we wanted to highlight is the culture of digital work being supported by soft money, one-time funds, and precarious labor. Innovative and experimental projects can be funded in the short term through grants or other means, but after they successfully debut and attention has waned, suddenly the resources needed for long-term maintenance are scarce. Getting the grant is celebrated, um, but the long-term work to keep things going successfully is not. Eventually, the grant funding dries up, precariously employed people move on, and administrators look for the next big thing to catch a funder's eye. This short-term success metric greatly undermines any long-term sustainability efforts achieved through financial investment in maintenance and is exactly the type of culture that leads to burnout, especially among the precariously employed. Think about how exhausting it must be to have to, pro to have proven that you have a winning idea, a working project, and not being able to keep it going because funders have moved on to the next big thing and no one is willing to commit hard funds. How challenging it must be to build a career on soft money funded positions that may require somebody to move across the country to stay employed, which as we all know, is not an easy or available thing to do for everybody. So all of this can also be seen in the culture of digital humanities work, where one-off or short-term projects and open source technologies can burn out as quickly as they come to life due to precarious funding coming to an end. Such projects further exemplify the culture of digital scholarship where innovation is valued, but maintenance, even of something that is extremely useful to other scholars, is not. Um, another pattern that we wanted to highlight, is, uh, talk about a little bit, is invisible labor, which I've already talked about a little bit. We're going to go in a little bit more depth here. Um, so obviously, librarianship is full of invisible labor, labor which is essential to keep things running smoothly, but otherwise forgotten. Maintenance work is also full of invisible labor, but we wanted to specifically highlight some of the types of invisible labor that impact women more specifically. So digital scholarship often involves working in teams that bring different expertise to the project, such as subject ex expertise or technical skill. The ability to organize the work, translate concepts, manage expectations, help people over project stumbling blocks, navigate challenges, learn as they progress through and learn as they progress through the project requires significant emotional intelligence and emotional labor. So managing the emotions of others. Um, it's a critical piece of any consultations or partnerships digital scholarship librarians take on. While taking on this emotional labor, helping people through frustrations or technological limitations can ensure the success of a project, it isn't usually recognized. Furthermore, male innovators are not usually expected to take on emotional labor. They are allowed to stick to advising or otherwise contributing strictly within their areas of expertise, um, but women innovators are often looked to for additional emotional labor. This makes what might appear to be an equal workload for men and women actually are a heavier workload for women because of the implicit and gendered expectations put upon them. Similarly, um, organizational citizenship behaviors or OCBs are invisible labor that employees do to care for their workplace. Often it's these office housework style tasks, administrative work that's essential to keep things going smoothly, but it doesn't generate revenue, it's time consuming, and it's generally considered menial. Um, think about coordinating calendars for a meeting, for example, or event planning. Uh, women usually end up uh, fulfilling the gendered expectation that they will be good campus citizens and take on or get assigned these maintenance and service oriented tasks, um, while men are allowed to focus on their job responsibilities. Even if women are in a more privileged innovator role, um, they often find themselves taking on or being assigned uh, care and maintenance work while their male colleagues are allowed to focus strictly on the more valued and visible portions of the job. Um, this traps women in a perpetual cycle of undervalued administrative housework, including emotional labor and invisible OCDs, OCDs yeah, while their innovator colleagues move unencumbered 
from one scholarly project to the next. And to address a comment in the chat, I cannot take credit for coming up with the term organizational citizenship behaviors. That actually came out of a really amazing paper, um, which is listed in our references list. So that I highly recommend everybody read. Um, so here we have a chart that we've used to show the spectrum of impacts based on whether or not um, a position is innovation or maintenance based, and then also the gender of the person um, who is in that position. Um, so we this chart illuminates some patterns we noticed both from our time in working in digital scholarship and throughout the literature. Uh, the divide between innovation and maintenance uh, positions mimics the challenges of binary gender dynamics, but the gender of the person in the position also compounds that impact. So innovators um, have a great deal of autonomy over which projects they consult on and how involved they are in the project. They're often allowed to set their own boundaries, um, often within the confines of any policies that may or may have been set by their department. Um, and they're allowed to manage their own time. Um, they usually have titles and job descriptions that speak to their expertise, that things that have digital scholarship, digital humanities, research, data management, GIS, et cetera, in their titles. Um, and that expertise is respected during consultations. And um, they're not expected to do anything outside of sort of the boundaries of their position. Um, they're often treated as equal to the faculty that they're working with on a project, receiving credit and invited to publish and present alongside others on the project. They also have leeway to ask for technology, software, or other resources that may have budget impacts, um, especially if these are one-time funding requests. In our experience, um, those requests are often granted with minimal pushback. The caveat is if the innovator happens to be a woman. While uh, you know they should be able to operate in the same manner as their male colleagues, um, women face additional hurdles in being able to do their job. Their authority and expertise is often questioned more, leading to a situation where they have more oversight and less flexibility than their male colleagues. Um, they're often expected to do more emotional labor, which we just talked about. Um, finally, they're also implicitly expected or directly assigned um, more other duties as assigned, uh, regardless of whether or not those tasks are associated with their job. Um, this again impacts the bandwidth of the women in the position and their ability to do the job as efficiently and effectively as their male colleagues. We've seen this taken to extremes at times where a female innovator is tasked with doing almost entirely other duties as assigned and then not recommended for promotion because of it, or women having to leave their positions because they weren't able to operate with the same latitude as their male colleagues, only to be replaced with men who were indeed given the type of authority and autonomy the women sought. Um, women may also not be granted all of the resources that they need to do their jobs. For example, not being granted access to higher end software or computing, even when it's in their job descriptions. Whereas male innovators, um, in our experience, have often been given appropriate resources, sometimes without even having to ask. Um, so, and you see a similar pattern with the maintenance positions. Overall, maintenance positions are mission critical, uh, but because the work is not usually as visible, experimental, shiny um, as the work of innovator positions, they are at a disadvantage in terms of budget and resource requests and receiving credit for their work. The work is not usually as uh, project-based as that of the innovator positions, so there can be fewer opportunities to receive credit, um, to be on publications or presentations, even if those innovative projects might be built on the work that they do. Women in these uh, positions are even further disadvantaged. Again, their expertise is often questioned and they have to jump through more hoops to prove themselves um, as compared to their male colleagues. This further impacts their ability to receive the resources they need in order to do their work. Male maintainers are likely to are more likely to be successful with their um, resource requests uh, than their female counterparts. Um, they're also more likely uh, women uh, in these positions are also more likely to be assigned administrative and documentation tasks than their male colleagues, meaning they get to spend uh, less time on the core functions of job and what they're evaluated on. 
So all of this contributes to a culture where instead of all of the labor being visible and valued and everybody being able to, to work together um, on sort of an even, even footing, there's a hierarchy of privilege um, based on the type of work and the gender of the person in the role. Naturally, this can have some significant impacts. So let's talk about those impacts. Uh, what we've discussed so far is that it's easier for people in innovator positions to get credit. They're doing highly visible novel things, often project-based, with a much higher likelihood of presenting at conferences and publishing. The work that maintainers do often contributes to the success of these projects. But because it's not as visible, it's not as likely to receive credit or other career advancing opportunities like co-authorship. It's often easier for innovators to be able to talk about the value and impact of their work because it's reflected in the priorities and guiding documents of our institutions whereas maintenance work is excluded from them and thus makes it more challenging for its value to be recognized because it's less visible. It also makes it harder to receive approval for professional development funding. Getting appropriate funding for conferences, continuing education, workshops, webinars, et cetera, is already challenging at a lot of institutions due to budget limitations. So when maintenance activities, even those that solve problems or streamline work are not as, a, not as valued or documented as priorities, it can be really hard to receive appropriate funding. On top of that, women are more likely to have at-home care responsibilities, which makes professional development and devoting time outside working hours to their career harder, if not impossible. Even when women receive support and budget approval for professional development, they might not be able to travel considering both the financial and emotional costs of child and or elder care. And while strides have been made toward providing accommodations for nursing mothers, such as providing lactation spaces at conferences, the majority of national library conferences provide no information on child care options. The lack of individual recognition and professional development opportunities ultimately hinders career progression for maintainers and women in our field. Given the increase of office housework, uncredited emotional labor, and tirelessly advocating for resources, it's more challenging to meet the expectations of tenure or promotion on the standard timeline, or more challenging to make the case of impact because their activities aren't in the institution's guiding documents. And for those that aren't on a specific clock to go up for promotion, these factors can make it take longer before they're deemed worthy to move up in their career. So the longer it takes then to go up for promotion, the longer it's likely to be between promotion related raises. So in the case of merit-based raises, the challenges in showing impact and continued career growth and the fact that maintenance work isn't valued means that it can also impede a maintainer's ability to access salary raises as their accomplishments are considered less notable or critical than those of their innovator colleagues. We'd also be remiss if we didn't mention that men at every level of librarianship make more than their female colleagues. Starting salaries do contribute to this, but there's an increasing body of research showing that salary negotiation is actually not a contributing factor as widely once believed, as women are actually more likely to negotiate, but less likely to receive as much from the negotiation as men. We've also observed male innovators being hired in at or more quickly promoted to higher ranks than their female colleagues. The difference between support, recognition, and opportunity for growth between maintenance and innovator positions and the further impact of gender within them ultimately results in a toxic environment full of resentment as the privileged easily get what they need while others have to tirelessly advocate for the time and baseline resources just to do the core functions of their jobs. All of these factors converge to form an environment where male innovators were highly privileged receiving the majority of funding, accolades, and overall support. 
Meanwhile, female innovators and maintainers were relegated to doing the majority of the emotional and invisible labor to keep things running smoothly, even at the cost of their own career advancement. And while systemic changes supported by administrators are needed to fully address the gendered culture around digital scholarship work, we are recommending some actions that can be employed at a much smaller scale to begin to affect change. So to help address the inequities between the different classifications of work and the overall impact of gender on opportunity, we can refer back to the moral feminist theory of care ethics. Feminist scholars define this as an ethic that centers on neutralizing power dynamics through human connection and understanding. And unlike patriarchal modes of operating, care ethics embraces and values emotions when making moral decisions. But morality doesn't happen in isolation. It's embedded inside other structural and social standards which inherit the limitations from our culture imposed by white supremacy and capitalism. So on a local level, we can assess the political context of our workplaces, locate those inherited limitations and implement an ethic of care, not just to care for our fellow colleagues and patrons, but to extend that care to the information and objects we steward as well. And while implementing care ethics within digital scholarship work cannot fully abolish the harm caused by these larger cultural systems, it can help to mitigate the impact of harm on the people and the information and objects we work with. So next we're going to review some recommendations in hopes of instilling this ethic of care to move maintenance and maintenance workers to the center of our thinking about how we value and approach labor in digital scholarship. Issues of inequity can easily go unseen and unspoken by anyone not directly impacted, while those who are impacted may not have the social or political capital to raise their concerns or be taken seriously. Enacting an ethic of care within digital scholarship work then must be a collective endeavor by maintainers, innovators, and administrators in privileged positions of power. So one of our first recommendations is to um, conduct collaborative consultations and to use project charters to guide each project. Most digital scholarship projects begin as a consultation between a patron and a librarian, one who's typically in an innovator role. Sometimes this sort of one-on-one -on -one meeting is sufficient, but we found there were also plenty of times when questions or considerations would come up that we couldn't resolve without consulting additional people. So one of the things we tried was switching to a more collaborative based model where every member of the team, regardless of whether they were in an innovator or a maintenance position, was invited to every consultation. If it was clear the project wouldn't intersect with their expertise, they could opt out. But more often than not, when a project was in the beginning stages, it was helpful to have everybody at the table. In a lot of digital scholarship projects, maintenance work, the technological underpinnings um, only really became visible in panicked moments of breakdown or malfunction. And by including maintainers in the project consultations right up front, we were more able, we were more e easily able to craft a long-term project plan that took possible future breakdowns and archiving into consideration from day one. We recommend having this detailed project charter that outlines the roles and responsibilities of everyone who will contribute to the project, regardless of the size of their involvement. This clarifies what each individual will contribute and sets an expectation for the project's overall scope and timeline, ensuring everyone is on the same page. It also makes visible and gives credit to all contributors, including precariously employed contractors, students, or volunteers. Our project charters followed the model seen here on the slide. Um, we start with a project description, scope, timeline, then define individual roles and responsibilities. We document if there's any uh, funding involved, how those funds will be used, data management plan, um, provide agreed upon language for how participants will be credited um, throughout the project and in the future, particularly in any final outputs. Um, and, you know, 
give um, and talk about what kind of copyright and accessibility requirements need to be taken into consideration. And finally, something that's really, really important is have a defined lifespan for the project. Um, is this something that um, we're going to grow over time or is this is there going to be a static final product that we keep online for a certain number of years and then sunset? Working through all of these considerations and writing these project charters with patrons and partners helps them understand the full scope of what it takes to do digital scholarship and ensures everybody's expectations are on the same page and ensure everybody receives appropriate credit. Um, going through this process also ensures that we're putting maintenance at each project's core rather than leaving it unconsidered when chasing the new and exciting. Um, and it leads to a more thoughtful scholarly output where all the work is visible and valued. So our second recommendation is to document and update internal policies and workflows. Much like project charters, thoroughly documenting internal workflows with assigned responsibilities centers and makes visible the maintenance-based labor necessary for our teams and our library to succeed. We found that documentation was especially important for cross-departmental workflows, such as digitization, metadata, and repository work. But other workflows could include things like the renewal of software licenses to ensure ongoing access to patrons, and negotiating contracts with academic publishers for access to their content. The labor that goes into creating and executing these policies is truly significant. But it frequently remains unseen and unacknowledged as it, become, it, uh, as it becomes part of standard operating procedures. On par with documentation, it's important for team members to work together on creating and maintaining a space for broad dissemination and access to these workflows. We have found that tools like Google Sites, SharePoint, LibGuides, or other wiki-based platforms work really well for compiling documentation into a central space. Staff should also iterative, iteratively revisit documentation to ensure they are up to date and that work is evenly assigned among appropriate team members. So in our workplaces, a lot of the policies that we were involved in we made sure to build in timeframes for reevaluating and really documenting like who is responsible for reevaluating the workflows and when does that happen? And then our next recommendation is to establish an internal cross-training program and divide operational tasks, including committee work as equally as possible amongst team members. Professional development funding can be really hard to secure as a maintainer so an internal cross-training program can be a great alternative for gaining new skills and honing existing ones. And this helps further equity on the team by enabling team members to assist each other when one person might have just too much on their plate or somebody needs to step away for an extended period of time due to caregiving responsibilities or other personal circumstances. Maintainers tend to have significantly more administrative and committee work. So any cross-training program should also have innovators take part in those committees too. By including individuals on a committee who do not have direct workflow or program responsibilities, you actually end up gaining an outside perspective when making these group decisions. And this has the opportunity to increase both the quality of work and to equalize the amount of work distributed amongst team members. One example of this is having a data specialist, which is typically an innovator position, be part of something like a digitization committee that's mostly composed of maintainers. The data specialist might have insight on how to approach decision-making from a different perspective. For instance, they might have a better understanding of how patrons want and can leverage digital collections metadata if only that metadata was formatted differently. That then leads to the data specialist actually learning a lot more about the labor that goes into the metadata creation. And the metadata librarian then learns more about how patrons wanna use metadata in partnership with digital scholarship tools. 
So our last recommendation is for managers to distribute work that falls outside of job descriptions equitably among the team and to regularly revisit job descriptions for scope creep and accuracy. It's important to recognize that an overabundance of non-position related tasks takes away opportunities for an employee to work on strategically important functions that would both aid the institution and help them grow their career. These other duties as assigned are often distributed in a gendered fashion, where women are given an abundance of office housework. In order to prevent this, managers should work closely with their reports to document the full scope of each team member's responsibilities and not just rely on what is written in the job descriptions. Writing everything out allows managers to visually see how much work each person is doing and makes it easier to redistribute tasks if certain team members have lighter loads. By documenting all the required labor involved in each position, appropriate weight and recognition can be given to the impact of these tasks in annual reviews and tenure or promotion packets, as well as helping to document individuals' career growth. Similarly, administrators should include maintenance in their strategic plans and other guiding documents to bring awareness to the criticality of this work and to secure your resources, including labor, um, that maintenance requires. Ideally, a full review of job descriptions would be done annually, and that they would be updated as needed to reflect any changes to the scope or the duties of the position. While some institutions allow this, um, we recognize that this would be impossible to do at others, and thus the more informal documentation accompanying a job description would do. You know, as a manager myself, I have worked with people to rescope, retitle, and update duties and job descriptions, and also regularly check in with them to ensure that their other duties assigned, uh, other duties as assigned, don't grow overwhelming and they're more equitably distributed. It is work, but it is important work that every manager should be doing to ensure better equity on their teams. So. We understand that the adoption um, of any of our recommendations will not repair the systemic inequalities which govern our society and our institutions, but we do believe that they can help further equity within our own spheres of influence and help to mitigate the harmful consequences of gendered labor at our more, a more localized level. In order to recenter maintenance as a core value, we need to move from buzzwords to values and from means to ends. The language we use in our job descriptions, strategic plans, and mission statements must be intentional and reflect both innovation and maintenance. Doing so improves the visibility of maintenance work and enables women to frame their labor as mission-driven and not just operational. By collectively increasing the visibility of maintenance work and being mindful of the impact of position and gender privileges in the workplace, we can increase equity within digital scholarship teams and create a culture centered on care, which values and rewards all labor as central to success. And so now, 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 thanks for listening to us. And uh, <laughs> we're curious to hear, you know, questions and discussion. What inspired you to to work together on this project. Do you want to go or do you want me to go? I, I can go. Um, okay. So Stephanie and I um, uh, were, um, Stephanie, I have worked in digital scholarship um, and we have worked together at um, institutions uh, before. So we're, we're former co-workers. And really, this kind of came out of really just us noticing um, patterns in the workplace throughout our careers, and then uh, wanting, and then we decided to start looking into the literature to see if, you know, these patterns might be found elsewhere. And once we found that it wasn't necessarily just something you know, unique to places where we had worked, um, we wanted to start thinking about how to tie all these threads together and, um, you know, wanted to see if 
others could benefit from maybe some of these uh, things that we had um, tried to sort of move the needle on some of these inequities in the past. I don't know, Stephanie, if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I'll just also say that um, I think the reason why we were interested in exploring this topic specifically in relationship to digital scholarship and not necessarily talking about librarianship on a whole, even though a lot of this is applicable across the board, um, is that it's this disparity between innovation and maintenance is also seen just widely within general technology fields. Women are underrepresented in tech fields and are often disadvantaged. Um, and so I think it's just something as two women who are working in that space, a lot of times the majority of our coworkers are gonna be men. And there is a difference, even like, I can say I have had some truly fantastic male coworkers, like truly, and, um, even with their support, you just see day to day how things are a little bit different for them. And it's just something we kept noticing and kept talking about. So that's kind of how it came to be. Interesting. We have a question in the chat. Have you tried implementing any of these recommendations locally? Curious to know what the pearls and pitfalls of that endeavor may have been. Sure, yeah. So we, um, yes, we have implemented a lot of these things, um, whether it be um, where Amanda's working, where I'm working, places we've worked in the past, we've implemented different versions of these depending on, you know, the institution and what makes sense. Um, I think we've had a lot of success in a lot of different ways. My, like the big one of all the recommendations, I really do think the big one is those project charters, which is totally like, I give all credit to Amanda for coming up with that. Um, it's really impactful. You know, I um, my role within digital scholarship is mostly in the managing of digital collections, which is a very maintenance heavy position. And so I wasn't really like in my career, I don't really um, work in this like forward facing role where I'm meeting with patrons all the time. Um, but some of my colleagues are like the GIS librarian or the digital scholarship librarian. Um, and it was really nice being able to go start going to all of our consultations because what would happen is these like legacy projects from many years ago would just like fall into my lap and it was like how do we preserve this what do we do and it's like okay the people that initially started this project maybe aren't even alive anymore like this is you know it's it's like a little too late to think about this um because we don't have enough context and I'm also busy. <laughs> and so I think really having these conversations from the start of like, what do you want your project to look like? You know, do you want to grow it over time? Is there going to be a new set of data every year that we want to add to this? And really, like, I think that made such a positive impact um, in our workplaces, because it just, it really did allow the patron to have a much better understanding of how we could support them. So it's kind of like a two way street where the patron is significantly benefiting from this really understanding how can this full team support me. And then also planning out a timeline where it's like, maybe my part of helping with this project doesn't come until 10 months from now. But then I know on my calendar in 10 months, I need to block out the time to work on this. And that is really helpful in just like respecting everybody's time and labor that they bring to the table. Yeah, um, I don't think I really have anything else to add about the project charter um, piece of it. Um, uh, um, it's super helpful. It, it is- Is um, the project charter gonna be in your book chapter? Yes, there is a sample project charter. Um, the the sample that I, I developed and was using on a regular basis, um, at uh, when I was in a more forward-facing role before I moved into uh, a middle management role. Um, 
and, and I see that there is uh, another question in the chat, which I can sort of a, a address um, along with one of the other things, uh, one of the other recommendations that I have put into place. Um, so yes, we, we are all busy. And the question is, how do we use these to help balance um, labor and expose and celebrate maintenance and lean into the slow efforts? So I do think that documentation efforts and project charters in general can be used to help um, do all of that on sort of these project levels because it really does force everybody to sit down and think through all of the considerations of a digital scholarship project and, you know, think about realistic timelines and, well, hopefully, hopefully think about realistic timelines and understand that there are going to be bumps in the road and, um, keeping track of, you know, who is, you know, who all of the different people and all of the different things that are contributing to the project so that they can be more visible so that they can be um, credited once the, the project goes live and becomes more visible. But I also think about that from sort of the management perspective and manage and um, and managing a, a, a digital scholarship team or, or similar um, teams. Um, and I think that can be, um, like I said, I, I think it's one of those things that's really can be challenging, but it's really important to do is to be regularly sitting down with everybody to be go over all of their commitments to make sure that all of their commitments are not out of whack, that they do have the time to be doing the core functions of their job, to have the resources for their job. Um, and also, if you're on the tenure track, that they have the time set aside for scholarship, for service, and that these things are in balance. And um, being willing to back people up in saying no, and you know, being willing to go, uh, you know, uh, uh, up the chain in advocating for your people and saying no, in saying we cannot take these things on without extra labor or extra resources or things like that. So I do think that um, while you know everybody should be able to do that for themselves, I do think that you know your manager plays, you know, or your supervisor plays a key role in. Um, needing to, you know, sort of be that advocate and be that support and, and help, you know, keep things manageable and equitable. And that's certainly something that I have, I spend quite a bit of time <laughs> doing. Um, and I think every manager should. <laughs> yeah, I'll also just add to that. Um, we, you know, we talked, one of the things we talked about was, um, short-term success metrics, which is something I feel pretty strongly about, is um, very prevalent within our field of, like, we did this thing, and we launched this thing, and it's amazing, and um, is that really success? It just, like, doing one thing, but then there's people in the back office who are trying to, like, keep it alive, and nobody's looking at them, Um you know, like for, for example, when we talk about like digitization workflows, a lot of times in, in digital archiving projects, the success metric is, did we, did we digitize what we wanted to? Like, it's like, oh, we digitized this one collection. It's very important. Maybe we got grant funding for it. And now that collection is online. And that's our short-term success metric, right? Like that's a big thing and it's a big win. But in my view, as somebody who does the ongoing work of all of that, my success metric is, can I create a workflow that not only applies to digitizing one collection, but digitizing all of our collections? Can I create workflows that aren't dependent on the specific individuals in these roles, but just in the role in general? You know, like these workflows have to live beyond us and... I think um, we just have this huge culture of moving really fast and saying yes to things that we don't, that we maybe shouldn't be saying a full yes to, like it should be more of a negotiation to get to that place. Um, and yeah, so I think that just, it makes it really hard for maintenance, anyone in a maintenance-based position to really advance in their career because nothing that they're doing is considered successful within these short-term requirements that we have. Um, so that's, that's another one that could like, 
I, I do think I like that you use the word slow in the question um, because I think, yeah, we just, we need to slow down and really think about what we're doing. And there's been times in my career so far that I have been able to do that and the project's outputs are always better. Um, so yeah, a little mix of both. I like creating workflows that go beyond the, the person or the project that you're working on. I think yeah. that's important for sustainability. Um, there's another question. Do you find that the binary of innovator and maintainer is even a productive distinction in digital scholarship? Or in the ideal world, would all team members practice both forms of labor? Is that feasible or is that the specialization still beneficial? Um, That's a good I question. Yeah, it is a good question. Um, do you mind if I jump in, Stephanie? No, of course not. Okay. Um, so I, I, I don't think it is an unproductive distinction. I think there are some people who have skill sets that are, you know, more, you know, make them that might make them better at the work of, you know, an innovator role. And there are some people who, you know, are really amazing at these maintenance roles. And I, I think the key isn't necessarily um, that there, sh there shouldn't be any distinction and more about getting them to work together and understand each other. Um, I, I, so I don't necessarily think that specializing in one way or another is bad. Um, we can't, um, y y there, there are some levels of expertise you can only get with a certain level of um, specialization and that becomes really important in a lot of, pro on a lot of projects. Um, but I think the key is to not let the balance get out of whack. I do think that maintainers should have um, should should have if they don't already co have coming into the the position that they should work to gain a level of understanding and respect for you know the the maintenance piece of this work and um, and vice versa. Um, I don't know if anybody else is a theater person. I come from a theater background and it's very much like, you know, the actors and the stage crew all need to work together in order to for the production to go on. Um, and ideally, both of them will have an understanding and respect for the roles, even if they are not necessarily um, the best at the other person's role. So I, I don't necessarily think that having a distinction between the two is unproductive. They're all, they're both bringing important aspects to digital scholarship work. It's really about making sure that everybody has an understanding and a respect and that there's a visibility to all of it. Yeah, I will um, also just add to that, that maybe it's, maybe it's less about making a distinction between them and more about like redefining what those words mean. So like, as I was talking about earlier with the short-term success metrics and creating digitization workflows, like I've created some policies and some workflows in the past handful of years that I think are really innovative, that I'm super proud of. And, but that stuff is not classified as innovation work. Um, it's just regular old policy stuff. Um, and it's not uh, celebrated in the same way that some of the more flashy um, big projects get to be celebrated. So I think I think it, we, it's really important to just think a little more critically about like, what does innovation actually mean? Because like, why can't maintenance work be considered innovative? Because um, it, it often is, but it's just not, not really treated the same way. So yeah, I just wanted to add that. That was a really good question, by the way. Thanks, Audrey. If we don't have any more questions, thank you all for coming and spending your lunch or afternoon with us on a Thursday afternoon in the middle of October and busy semester. So thank you all. And thank you to our speakers, Stephanie and Amanda. Um, hope you all have a great day. Thanks so much for joining us, y'all.